Good morning, and welcome to this Labor Day Sunday special of The Eclectic Radical. I'm Chris Richards, The Eclectic Radical, as always, and it's my pleasure to introduce candidate for president of the United Auto Workers, Will Lehman. Uh, Will, please tell, introduce yourself and tell the tell the audience a bit about yourself. I'm Will Lehman, and I work at Mack Trucks in McCundry, Pennsylvania. Uh, I've been there for five years, and I'm running for uh, as uh, he he just said the international presidency of the UAW, and I'm running on a platform to abolish the bureaucracy of the UAW, and we can get into that in a little bit. Sounds good. Um, I am thinking that, that that is exactly what we need. I know that Mac had a big strike not terribly long ago. Yeah, uh, 2019, uh, first time in 30-some years. Uh, there are a lot of different opinions about how the strike was carried out, and a lot of essentially uh, n negative feelings about how the strike was carried out, uh, be you know, 275 a week at that time for strike pay and uh it didn't really seem like they were getting anything done that we wanted and it just kind of was uh, uh disenfranchised workers from that kind of fight but uh, yeah. it was it was authorized though 79 percent ahead of time uh people authorized the strike they wanted to fight uh but the reality is that fight got misled yeah i remember I remember uh, reading a lot about that. Um, the The previous contract had been bad and it had a bunch of concessions. And the new contract didn't undo any of the concessions from the, the last contract, which had, I had thought had been the whole point of the strike. Well, there was a lot of things that people wanted done. I mean, me personally, I wanted the abolition of tears. Uh, we... We have tiers of Mack trucks. It's a little different than uh, the TPT type status uh, where you can be on there with indefinitely. Um, it's more broken up into years, but it's gotten uh, consistently worse. Uh, the, you know, the tier system is terrible. And you know, that's one of the things I'm running to abolish as well. Uh, other candidates say they want to abolish it. But again, it's it's what kind of fight are you going to lead to do that? And I'm proposing an international fight uh, to abolish the tiers. It's workers everywhere have to be united on these things uh, in order to fight the companies appropriately. Volvo is a multinational company, and we need a uh, worldwide fight if we're going to successfully win. Well, that's true. They have workers everywhere. I mean, if you can move a factory from, uh, from is it Sweden? Yeah, from Sweden to the U.S. to Mexico to China, as you need to, in order to to better your corporate interests, then right. workers in all those places need to to be in solidarity with each other to 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 better their interests as workers. I completely agree with that. You have mm -hmm. to be able to coordinate strikes internationally these days, and that's one of the UAW's major flaws. It's, it's national uh nationalistic approach uh to these kinds of fights um you know it, it tries to wind workers up uh you know trying to uh promote you know america first and uh, made in usa when the reality is all these cars are made of global components uh by workers internationally and we've got to recognize that we're all in that same fight and that's part of what i'm running on too is building that class consciousness you know win or lose I want workers to realize that we're all on the same side, you know, the working class and our enemy, the one who's trying to sell us out, uh, get us to fight each other is the ruling class. It's Volvo, it's Ford. Uh, you know, Ford is doing the same thing right now. Uh, Saar Louis, Germany, they're shutting down a Ford plant uh, by 2025. Workers there have said possibly sooner. And they did that by pitting uh, workers in IG metal uh, against workers in uh, Ford in Spain, in Valencia, uh, who is under UGT. They basically said, we're going to be making electric cars. We're not going to need as many workers. Uh, both, both of those trade unions give us your uh, most competitive offer. So again, it's a race to the bottom for the workers. And I'm proposing something entirely different, uh, where we can say, uh, we'll, we'll not only shut down Ford in Spain if you shut down Ford in Germany, 
we'll shut down Ford in America too. And you won't, uh, you won't make $1 uh, of profit unless you keep us, the working class safe. So, this, you know, it's not about pitting workers against each other. It's about international solidarity. This, this brings up an important point. I don't like to talk about social media too much on the show, but this is actually something that I think is, is indicative of, of the, some of the, the, the nationalism and also sectarianism in the, in the labor movement. I was blocked by the leader of the auxiliary for the, the warrior met mine strike because I was saying very aggressively, you need to strike across multiple sites. And she was very angry at it. It's illegal. It's illegal. And I, I seem to remember that there was a time when just striking was illegal and unions did it anyway. Yeah. And, and that too, um, what I try to tell every worker I come across is, you know, that's your labor power is your commodity that you're selling to these companies. And it should be, it, it really is your right to withhold it at any time. And any bureaucracy that prevents you from doing that is not your friend, whether it's the, uh, you know, warrior met or whether it's the UAW or, uh, CEA or the NEA for uh, the teachers that I was talking to in Columbus, you know, I basically went to that uh, strike and I was telling uh, those teachers that if I had my way, all 372,000 active uh, UAW members would be shutting uh, the uh, automakers down and coming to your strike and backing your fight. And there were some picket captains there that didn't even want me talking to the teachers. And, uh, you know, it's, it's that blocking of that worker solidarity that these trade unions are really the promoting. And it's the bureaucracies of them. It's not the workers. Workers love when they have support from the outside, from other workers, even, uh, you know, workers internationally. Like last year with NRV's strike, uh, workers in Ghent, Belgium, walked out, wildcatted over uh, basically an increase in time to their work week. And, you know, that's something that we've got to recognize. We're, we're all together in these things. And it's growing, and I'm trying to do my best to help promote that class consciousness uh, from where I can. But go ahead. I did see that the the negotiators uh, of that awful tr of that awful uh, contract with with Mac did lose their jobs in their local. Well, yeah, they lost them in their local, but uh, one was promoted to international, and the other retired. And the funny thing about the one that was promoted to international is he had 20 some years in a Mac could have had a very nice spot, pretty much any spot he wanted on the floor. Uh, but he uh, got promoted instead. And again, that's the bureaucracy I'm, I'm referring to workers recognized that this wasn't someone that was working in their best interests. You know, some workers backed him, but for the majority that voted him out, you know, that's, that's a sign that you need to come back to the floor and maybe, you know, be around the workers that, uh, decided that you weren't the best fit. And really, uh, any of these types of reps should have been able to re be recalled at any time. Um, you know, any kind of leadership position shouldn't be a number of years that you're guaranteed. should be recalled at any time if, you, if it's going to be in a representative capacity. And, and, and this is just my opinion. I'm very interested in your opinion. But if you're serious about democracy, whether you're talking about workers' democracy or public democracy, anything that you're supposed to be ruled by the people, then if somebody loses an election, isn't it kind of anti-democratic to give him an administrative position that's essentially a promotion after he's been rejected by workers at his own local? Yeah, absolutely. And... That's how this bureaucracy operates, though. Uh, this was someone that uh, walked hand in hand with Biden when he came to uh, Mac last year and the company executive. Uh, what his name is at the moment. Uh, Martin Weisberg, I believe it is president of Mac right now. Yes. Uh, they're all interchangeable. And anyway, uh, they're, they're all walking happy hand in hand and promoting nationalism, promoting made in USA. And same thing with this microchip shortage trying to scapegoat China, uh, the Chinese over uh, microchips when that's the reality of global production. You know, and I, go ahead. No, no, this is this just brings, <laughs> the joke of that, of course, is even as they pay lip service to 
economic nationalism in order to to get the workers to support their their their, their microchip legislation we had nancy pelosi risk an international conflict with china to go to taiwan to get a group to make sure that people in Taiwan knew that their factories weren't being cut out just because the U.S. wanted to to boost domestic production, right? And that's that's the U.S. trying to assert their interests internationally, just like with Russia, uh, just like with sending all these arms to Ukraine. You know, it's, it provoked Russia into attacking, and it's and what I try to tell workers everywhere as well is, you know, we have no problem with any with any Russian worker, with any Ukrainian worker or any Chinese worker. So why are these people at the top starting these wars? Why are they funding these wars? You know, billions for armaments uh, for Ukraine and nothing for the people back home, austerity for the working class. I, I, I said exactly the same thing yesterday uh, and a couple of days again before that. Billions for the Ukraine and cops and nothing for the homeless. Right, yep. And, and same thing, I mean, the police problem is, you know, one thing that really struck me is uh, when I visited uh, Michigan and looking at that uh, memorial for the uh, Ford hunger marchers, you know, they're yes. marching for the same things that we have problems with today and the police same way as today were uh, against them. You know, and I, I tell guys I work with, you know, those were your grandparents, uh, that, that type anyway, the auto worker type, they were marching against the police and the, you know, the state essentially and Ford. Ford didn't do anything. You can make lots. You can make lots of criticisms criticisms of the UAW over the years. You can make lots of criticisms, good criticisms of Walter Ruther, but Walter Ruther got shot because he was one of the last union leaders who still understood that the cops were not the workers' friends. Um, he got shot for being in solidarity with black workers demanding their rights in places where they were treated very discriminatorily because they were black workers and not white workers. He wanted all workers to have the same rights. He got right. shot. And well, <laughs> go ahead. This is, and I don't, I'm not trying to scare you or terrify you, but I mean, let's say you win. Are, are you prepared to to take that kind of risk if that's what it takes? Well, yeah, I mean, I resolved to take that kind of risk just running. I mean, there's I'm sure the UAW is hostile to me and I'm sure that, you know, the government is not going to be a fan of the things I'm saying to workers. So I've already resolved to take that risk. It's not something I enjoy, but, uh, you know, it's it's about standing up for what's right. And if we don't do it, you know, what's society going to turn into if we don't start standing up? It's to me, it's a uh, question of socialism or barbarism. We're heading for one or the other. And I'm trying to do my best to bring about socialism. So, you know, I would argue this is a comment from Gira Brown in the chat utopia for the rich, dystopia for the rest. Yep. I would argue that's where we already are. I mean, we talk about socialism or barbarism. It's barbarism now. It's it we're it's not just that we're sliding into worse barbarism, which we are, but we are living under barbaric conditions now, under a barbaric liberal state that has no regard for human rights, even even as it pays lip service to their inalienability. Yeah, and they're opening, you know, the door for it to be much worse. Uh, not yeah. only with, uh, you know, this aggression against China and Russia, uh, they're the two nuclear powers. I don't know that they've lost their minds, essentially. I don't I don't know how to put it any other kind of way. I know they have their own fallout shelters, but uh, we don't. And the reality is we don't like I said, we don't have any backing in that fight in the working class. We're not interested in that fight. Uh, we're interested in making a decent living, uh, raising a family. Uh, and basically looking out for, you know, having a decent retirement as well. And the UAW criminally neglects retirees. Uh, and that's those are the things we got to be focusing on. That's the society we've got to be building towards, not uh, pr uh, allowing ourselves to get swept up in any kind of war, you know, with any of these other countries, because certainly not in my interest. I mean, I just have to keep reiterating that. Mm -hmm.
I'm glad you mentioned retirees because during the COVID pandemic, and which is still going on and people don't like to talk about it, there has been a lot of casual disregard for the lives of retirees and disabled people who are not as safe as the government and the the business establishment want to say that the general population is. You hear people talking about, well, healthy people don't have anything to worry about uh, if they get COVID. Young people don't have anything to worry about if they get COVID. And then the question comes up, what about people who aren't healthy and young? Your politicians talk about the dignity of work. Doesn't every worker deserve a dignified retirement? Doesn't every worker who becomes disabled deserve dignified a dignified life? Yeah, and they absolutely do. And I remember that talk about, uh, oh, only if you have so many comorbidities. So what, that person is not... Uh, worthy of a life because they have a comorbidity. I mean, I had a coworker die that, uh, well, I'll t start from the beginning with it. Uh, there's a coworker I knew that loaded engines on the engine line of Mac. And uh, basically they forced him into work on a down week uh, and he caught COVID and he went out, was on a ventilator. And the only way we knew any of this was because his uh, niece was texting a, a coworker of ours and uh, he, went into a coma, couldn't be resuscitated. He was 61 years old. And he wasn't, he had a couple minor health issues. Uh, and he also didn't have the vaccine. But th that doesn't really matter to me. I mean, it, and I'm sure it doesn't matter to him that uh, he was treated less just for not, you know, and he was misled by, you know, propaganda from Trump. And, uh, but ultimately it came down to costing him his life. And to me, you know, whether they ha whether workers have different ideas about things, it's where those ideas came from, the top down. And he lost yeah. his life over something that uh, is our current, was our leadership was promoting, you know. Yeah. So the enemy there is the people promoting those ideas mm -hmm. from the top. And, you know, with the comorbidities as well. Yeah, those people don't absolutely don't deserve to die. They need, we should have taken China's stance I'm not going to really promote anything of any national government, but their stance with uh, zero COVID. If everyone would have done that, we would have been over COVID by now and back to normalcy. We, yeah, we could have stopped the pandemic with, I think somebody said, a six-week global shutdown. There would have been less economic pain than with all the stops and starts of, 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 of necessary shutdowns during outbreaks instead. It, 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 it also, the, the pandemic would have been over faster. People would be safe. Yeah, it, it, it just makes sense that, it doesn't make sense that they did what they did, it, except it does. Right. And this is absolutely correct. Elites chose eugenics for the old and disabled. They, they see people who are retired or disabled like Kami Squid is saying, useless eaters who aren't doing their bit to help society. Right. It, I'm sorry, go ahead. There is there is a movement afoot, and this movement operates along very similar lines in multiple places. It's it serves the direct interests of capitalism. But there is a movement afoot that it's linked to environmentalism, to anti-immigrationism, um, not the good sides of, our, of environmentalism. Obviously, we need to do something about climate crisis, but population control is never, the, and eugenics is never going to solve the, the, the climate crisis. Right. Um, you see this, don't do anything about the environment except conservation that, that eliminates uh, that, that takes native people out of their, their homes and puts them somewhere else. Don't do anything about immigration except to shut down the borders and keep people in dangerous places. Don't do anything about crime except to put more cops on the street and enforce the, the carceral state more, more firmly. Don't do anything about the economy except to help 
the landlord and the boss at the expense of the public. No, I agree. And I mean, to circle back around to the uh, COVID again, um, the UAW did nothing about COVID in the factories. It, I mean, especially at our factory, it did, you know, piecemeal things to put on a, an appearance of uh, they're doing something about COVID. And really it was only uh, because, you know, workers were very militant in the beginning about it uh, before all that top down propaganda was hitting everybody. You know, everybody viewed it as a concern in the very beginning. It took that propaganda to take that away. And the UAW absolutely could have been a leader, but it wasn't in their interest. It was in their interest to keep the companies happy and keep the companies profiting because their profit is tied to, as they see it, the companies. Whereas well, it's, that new, it's, that, it's that liberal thinking where the health of the industry matters for both the, the, the bosses and the workers. And well, maybe, I mean, in the sense that people have to be able to afford cars for the workers to have work and get paid, sure. But that doesn't mean that it's the state's job to keep an industry strong in an economy ruled by maximizing profits for shareholders. Right. And, and that too, you know, what would all the workers say? Uh, what, 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 uh, the democratic outcome of, uh, the situation have been, if all the workers did have a say, should we shut down our car, new cars essential? Uh, the, the vast majority of workers working in these auto plants can't afford the new cars they're producing now. It's so true. I'm pretty sure they don't care about those new cars being produced so much as they care about their life. And the UAW has assets, uh, chose not to wage any kind of fight against, you know, leading workers back into the factories and risking life uh, for profit. But that's not in their interest. And what I'm trying to advance, too, is all these safety issues you know, we can't ignore them. And workers know what's right involving these safety issues. So we've got to be the ones uh, to make democratic decisions about that. You know, using the rank and file committees, shutting things down when it's not safe. That need, that's up to us. Or, I mean, it's our lives that are on the line. So those decisions need to be up to us. I absolutely agree. I have a, this is actually a fairly good question because I know the UAW is in both the U.S. and Canada. Uh, Terry Stack, who is from Canada, asks, Will, are you planning on visiting UAW workers in Canada? Well, I mean, unfortunately, it's, it's a matter of time and I do have a regular job. Uh, I've burned pretty much all my time visiting, uh, we're going to the Detroit uh, back when we had our shutdown, that's where I used my first vacation for. And uh, this past down week um, that I had, I tried to visit as many plants as I can. So if the time allows, probably, but um, it probably won't. So I'm probably going to have to be virtually holding meetings with workers in these other areas. There's UAW members in Puerto Rico as well, and, and they're criminally overlooked. Uh, but it's not only about you know, UAW either. I'm trying to visit as many workers everywhere that I can, uh, you know, wherever a fight's breaking out, I'm going to try to get there if it's, if I'm able to. Um, but again, you know, if you're in the UAW in Canada or you know someone that is, I'd love to speak to them and they can contact my campaign and I'd love to set up calls with workers, you know, wherever they are. And even if it's not uh, auto work industry, you know, I try to make time for whoever is, you know, trying to see this in a rank and file type manner, uh, whoever is, you know, recognizing that we're all the working class I'm trying to talk to. This, this actually raises another good question because I thought of this while you were answering that. What does it say about both our, our union democracy and our public democracy that it's so hard for people who are actually working to actually do any sort of electioneering for president of the union or Congress or anything they might choose to run for in order to participate more actively in our democracy, whether at work or in the public sphere. Oh yeah, that's definitely by design. Uh, there are some uh, Jeep uh, workers in Toledo that they were working seven, 10 hour days. You know, they certainly would not be able to. And uh, I was speaking with one that was there for, five years 
and uh, he's a TPT, he topped out at $19 an hour. And he, they were working seven days a week, 10 hours a day. And he's got a family that he's trying to support. So it would be absolutely impossible for this person to do so. If, if he saw the same things and uh, had the same mindset as me, you know, our conditions are different. And we need that, you know, material equality. Uh, so he would be able to do that if, if he were to choose to. Uh, but we don't have that now. And yeah, it is definitely anti-democratic and it's by design. You know, it's squeezing the last cent out of every worker that they can. And even the last second, um, I was talking with another worker at Ventra in Evarn, Michigan. Her father worked in the Pontiac uh, plant, the one uh, where they made Fierros. And he basically died when he was 65, made a very good living for himself uh, and his family. But on his deathbed, he told her that he regrets all the time, the overtime he worked, all the time he worked, you know, when he could have been spending that with his family. And, you know, that's originally unions were supposed to be eight hours a day, uh, 40 hours a week, you know, five days a week. And you had enough pay uh, to sustain yourself off that. It's not supposed to be this, like you said, anti-democratic nature. No, I, I totally agree. Um, Here's a good question, too. Uh, Obi Strayhorn asks, where do I send donations to your campaign? Uh, I, I appreciate it. For one, uh, will for uawpresident.org. Uh, it's will, F-O-R, U-A-W, president.org. And I have a donation thing on there. And I appreciate any donations I can get. I often don't think about asking, but, uh, you know, it does help. I, I, I totally get it. I don't act, I don't ask people to join my Patreon and pay for the show as often as I should either. So I, I, I totally understand. Uh, I, I, I would rather. It, so, folks, remember, if you can afford it, first, contribute to your, your local mutual aid. Second, donate to Will's campaign if you can. And third, if you still have something left and you can't afford it, consider supporting the show. <laughs> uh I want to. I want to say. I think it is by design that they limit worker participation in public life. I I don't have as much experience on, in the, on the union side of things because I've I work uh, I work in a white collar working class job where people pretend that you're an office worker and not a worker, and that there's some difference between office workers and factory workers. And that we shouldn't be unionized because we have it so good, which is far from the truth. Um, I have fairly fortunate working circumstances myself, but I don't make the money I should for what I'm doing. Um, my coworkers don't make the money they should for what they're doing. Neither do the techs in the field who we support. Neither do the electricians in many cases in the fields that in the field that we support, especially if they're apprentices or journeymen. Yeah, no. Pretty um, much. Yeah, that's yeah. universal. Anyone in the working class knows they're in the working class because they're not making what they should. Someone's profiting off of them. And I'm, sh I'm sure that, uh, you know, CEO of Volvo, for example, is making over 57 million a year doing nothing. I mean, you can't justify that kind of inequality. Well, playing golf and making public appearances and going to board meetings where he just tells the board what everybody's telling him, whether it's true or not. Right. And I mean, yeah, I mean, I think, and I may even actually be overestimating the amount of work they do, but it really feels like CEOs have that, uh, that 16 hour work week for 40 hours pay that, uh, that the, the international workers of the world have been fighting for for years now. Oh, I'm, I'm certain. I think it probably is an overestimation. Like you said, uh, I mean, at least even if they are working 16 hours, uh, a day, I, a I can't imagine what that, whatever a week, yeah. I can't imagine what that work would even, even entail. Well, I mean, we know the joke. Uh, well, we know the joke that the media always used to make. They reported it seriously, but it was always a joke to me about Elon Musk going into the factory and working 16 hour days at Tesla. So Elon Musk is not a line worker. He's not a tech. He's not a technician. He's not a software engineer or programmer. 
There is nothing that him being at the office can accomplish for 16 hours except to make everybody at the factory stay there for 16 hours because he's there. Yeah. Yeah, I remember seeing the picture of him sleeping on the line or something like that. Yeah. That's sleeping. That's not working. Exactly. That. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he's, he's just a money man. He didn't even come up with the idea for Tesla. He bought uh, he just, Tesla. Right. Yeah, he's just money. And that money was off the exploitation of workers in Africa from his family. Yes, so, and and from his – because it's important – it's not just important to talk about how little billionaires work. It's also important to talk about how incompetent billionaires are. Elon Musk became rich enough to buy Tesla by almost ruining PayPal and being thrown out of the company, but they had to buy his stock because he was the majority owner. Yeah, the whole capitalist system is madness. And, and so he he failed up from PayPal to Tesla and is now the richest man in the world. Yep. That's disgusting. No, I know. I I've heard it before the point made that uh if hard work uh got you pay, then day laborers would be billionaires. Yes. And he's certainly not. But yeah, that's the system we're under. The system There's an we're old under. There's an old cartoon. There was an old comic strip called Life, Life with Father, which was about this guy from the the Boondocks who won the lottery, and he goes back to his hometown and he's talking to a a miner with a pickaxe and he says, "Hard work got me where I am today," and the miner with the pickaxe is thinking to himself, "Yeah, but who's?" Yeah, yeah, exactly, and you know workers. That's point, a big part of what I'm trying to promote, too, is that, that idea, that working class uh, consciousness, you know, and who's, like you said, labor is that produced off of? And what share should you be getting out of it, you know? And how do we distribute it? You know, same thing with uh, even in, you know, the auto workplaces. Uh, it's it's wholly and equally uh, distributed. Uh, Ventra Auto Parts work uh, manufacturers. They're a subsidiary, uh, subsidiary of Flex and Gate, and they're owned by Shahid Khan, who's a billionaire that owns the Jacksonville Jaguars. And I know the Jaguars are terrible, but uh, you know he's owning. He owns a football team while workers in Ventra are making fourteen dollars an hour. You know that's and inequality. You, and you've got this system by which, when you have these multiple corporate levels. That means each corporate level is taking a chunk out of the corporate level beneath it, which means there's that much less for the actual people doing work at each corporate level. Yeah. The top, that chunk, uh, that at the top, that chunk is going straight to, to, to share, shareholder profits and even at the at the highest level, there's far less for the workers because it's all coming out. It's all coming out of the corporation and being given to investors because they own the capital. They own the company. They own the means of production. They're the ones who are supposed to be making money according to the capitalist system. Right, and, and they. They're in the pot, like the trade unions are in the pocket of all these people. And, you know, I see lots of promotion for trade unions. But the reality is that's just trying to get that po labor police force over on the workers. You know, that's I mean, that's what I've come to see is that's all these trade unions are a labor police force. And while I do approve of workers organizations, what it's, that's what I'm trying to build with promoting the International Workers Alliance of Rank and File Committees. It's not about fealty to a trade union that's not doing anything for you. You know, it's about a workers organization that functions in the workers' interests. You know, so well, it's not just about saying I'm a proud union member. Uh, you know, it's about is that workers organization representing you accurately? Do you have a democratic say in it like we were discussing? This or not. This brings up one of my favorite anecdotes here because it's such a big win for labor in the Portland area, but it's so humiliating for the organized labor establishment. So we have a local fast food franchise here called Burgerville. Uh, in Los Angeles, it would be Fat Burger. 
um, in in uh, in in different cities of the world, it would be some different local franchise. Where I grew up in Southern California, just outside of LA, it was a little chain called The Hat. But it's all the same thing. It's that local gentry run, local fast food place whose owners aren't billionaires, but they're really successful millionaires and they have a big chunk of the local, the local market. They're important locally. They make money. They support both major parties so that they can get their way no matter who wins the elections. Um, they got unionized. The Burgerville, Burgerville got unionized. And it wasn't by any AFL organization. It wasn't by the SEIU. It wasn't by the, the folks leading the, 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 the folks doing the Starbucks, the Starbucks unionizing right now or Amazon. It was the international workers of the world. Burgerville was unionized by Wobblies. So as a result, they have a union organization that is absolutely committed to supporting them as opposed to expecting them to support it. And it's really been making a huge difference around here. And I just love to see it. And I hope that we see that I that we can see more success like that, both with rank and file committees within the, the organized labor force and with more outside unions like the IWW succeeding in places like Burgerville. Well, I, yeah, I understand that. I mean, it is, it is about workers recognizing, you know, that having that international class consciousness, um, I'm not too familiar with the Burgerville one. I'll have to read up on that, but, uh, you know, it's something that, uh, you know, I know workers, even when they do, try to unionize under these other unions they're trying to uh, make a way for themselves to have something better and typically that's routed into your traditional trade unions uh i know the you know the amazon labor uh union uh but it doesn't really have it doesn't have that international perspective you it's know true. and a lot of times it's just you know they're just trying to get dues off them i know like with the uaw they've tried to organize in other countries and a lot yeah. of those workers reject them for the, you know, all the UAW's faults. Same thing in the South. Uh, they can't organize in the South. You know, but people do recognize the faults of some of these trade unions, and that's why they fail. And, you know, the IWA RFC isn't about uh, paying dues to it or anything. It's about class consciousness and forming an organization to fight and recognizing that class consciousness worldwide, you know. Thanks, Will, for joining me. I really appreciate it today. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. And thank you very much to everybody in the audience for your comments and for your questions and for watching. And everybody, please share this, whether, whether you're liking it up on YouTube, whether you're sharing it on Twitter, whether you're posting it to your Facebook page, please share this. It's important as many people hear what Will has to say as possible. Thank you very much, and I hope you all have a great Sunday and a happy Labor Day tomorrow. Thank you.